Welcome and good morning, good morning at good Church morning. of the Good Shepherd. We like to thank Tim for being back to join us again with the choir. Nice to have you. We have a tradition of starting out welcoming our guests. So I'm going to start on the right, but I think I pretty much recognize all of you. So in the middle, nope, everybody's the same. And on the left, so glad to have you all back. And so nice to see all this green out here. It must be St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Woo! We're going to start with a few announcements. The crafting group will be meeting on Wednesday, March 20th at 10 a.m. And everybody is welcome to come. This Saturday, March 23rd, we will have the church spring cleanup. And it's only from 9.30 to 11.30. So anybody that can come, please come and help. That afternoon at 1.30, we will have Preston Jones service as well. And you can purchase Easter lilies until March 24th, and the <coughs> forms are outside on a table outside the office. We were going to have a moment of mission with Melanie Parker. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we have another birthday that we need to recognize today besides the ones that are in your digital bulletin. One Great Hour of Sharing celebrates 75 years of giving this year. Uh, this collection is taken by Presbyterians around the world on, around Easter Sunday each year to provide disaster assistance, feed the hungry, and provide opportunities to the poor. Your small gift makes such a difference and provides a lifeline to people like Bernadette in Syria, dealing with an ongoing civil war and an earthquake that, helps to re that helped to rebuild a community school, or Magda from Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria to provide greater opportunities to her impoverished community. From seeds and seedlings, heart kits and blankets, chickens, even chickens, to help to regain land to people in need, one great hour of sharing endures and triumphs over disaster. Over the next few weeks, you'll see more information about this timely offering. Uh, please help us to restore hope, feed the hungry, and empower the oppressed through your gift. Happy birthday, one great hour of sharing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and now for our birthdays. Today, on St. Patrick's Day, we have Sandy Hill, my dad in heaven, and Sammy Streeter. On March 23rd is Rick Wharton, and on March 21st, 24th is Brian Newman. Happy birthday to everybody. Now, uh, you stand and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitted on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing for near to the heart of God. <coughs>
Let us pray for the cleansing of our hearts, confessing our sins to the one whose mercy is everlasting. Redeeming God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart and have not loved our neighbors as we ought to. We have strayed from your commandments. Do not remember our sins, but forgive our iniquities that we may fix our eyes on you and sin no more. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Words of assurance. Sisters and brothers, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. May you delight in the joy of your salvation. Good morning. Good morning. And I'm just going to stick this in. Thank you to all of you who worked yesterday or came to see what goodies we had. It, we had a wonderful time together, all of those who worked. And they worked very, very hard, especially our, our leaders. Prayers for the following. Preston's family, Jerry, Barbara, Myrtle, Ted, Carol, Shirley, Richard, Ed, Sammy, Graham, and Maureen. And there will be more details after our service today. Our prayer of intercession. Please bow your heads. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. During the final days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. And in faithful obedience, he opened the way to eternal salvation. Let us open our hearts this day as we lift up our deepest needs and concerns to the one who is mighty to save. We pray for all leaders and people that by the power of your cross, you would drive out all violence, domination, and injustice in our world as you draw us to your Christ. We pray for our war-ravaged world that you would teach us to walk together in your way of righteousness and peace. We pray for the vocation of the church 
that our prayers would bear the fruit of action as we hear the cries of pain and suffering of those in need. We pray for the poor, the terrified, and the oppressed, and those who are too much alone, that they may find a home in you as we serve them in your name. As your son anticipated his death on the cross, in light of your steadfast love, may all who have died or who are dying be at rest in your eternal care. Through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we glorify you, Almighty God, with unending thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. And we pray the prayer that Christ taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, for God's tithes and our offerings of love. God, we ask your blessing on these ties and these gifts of love to the work of your mission, the work of your church.
Amen. Remain standing for Lord be glorified. Miss Eleni forward. Hi, everybody. Hi, Miss Eleni. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I see lots of green and teal out in the audience. Can anyone tell me anything about St. Patrick? He, yeah, I got the snakes out of Ireland. They definitely were never there in the first place. Um, St. Patrick was a very short man who lived at the end of the rainbow, and if you found him, you could take a pot of gold from him. Wait, no. That's not right. St. Patrick was a regular person who lived in England, but when he was a teenager, he was kidnapped by some people from Ireland, and they made him be their slave. Would you like to be a slave? How would you feel about the people who kidnapped you and made you their slave? I wouldn't like to be a slave. And I would probably be pretty angry at and maybe even hate someone who kidnapped me and made me be their slave. Well, six years later, Patrick escaped. He went back to England and he studied how to be a, a priest, a pastor. Then, do you know what he did? He prayed and he went back to Ireland and to the very people who had kidnapped him, and he told them about Jesus. Even though they had done something bad to him by kidnapping him and making him their slave, he did something good to them by telling them about Jesus. And that's what God wants us to do too. When people do wrong things to us, God wants us to do good things to them. We never do bad things back to people. We follow St. Patrick's example by doing good to everyone, even people who have done bad to us. Luke 6, 27 and 28 says, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And St. Patrick was so successful in getting the people of Ireland to believe in Jesus that eventually most of the people in the country became Christians. Let's play. Pray, Lord, help us be like St. Patrick. Help us do good things to people who wrong us. Help us to share your love with everyone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Bye, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day.
Thank you, choir. In addition to a thanks to everybody on the, um, on the fine work on the jumble sale, um, I want to say a special thank you to Richard Dundon, who headed it up. And it's always a challenge to be the head, the head person, right? You know? um, and uh, uh, so Richard reported to me, uh, and it's not the exact number, I don't have the exact number in my head, but it's around $4,500 uh, that we generated through the jumble sale. Yeah. That was outstanding. Our passage today comes from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31 and going through verse 34. Hear the word of the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So many years ago, I took a trip to New York City and New Jersey. Specifically, Atlantic City in New Jersey. While there in Jersey... I actually heard someone say, forget about it. <laughs> now, I never heard it when I was walking around uh, the streets of New York City, and hence my adopted title this morning of Lessons from the Jersey Shore, as opposed to Lessons from New York City, or perhaps more appropriately, Lessons from Brooklyn. <laughs> forget about it. It's a funny expression, and it turns out the exact meaning of forget about it is a little slippery and multifaceted. And because of the many meanings of forget about it, as spelled out in the 1997 movie Donnie Brasco, I chose the more poetic sermon title of Lessons from the Jersey Shore so that forget about it would not be scrolling on our electronic sign out front without any mooring of context. I thought that the safer choice. But today my only lesson from the Jersey Shore is the word or the phrase, forget about it. This word will help us through the theological riddle of God choosing to forget. And interestingly enough, it is the nebulousness of this Italian-American word phrase, forget about it, which may help us get closer to the meaning of what God is describing here. Forget about it. The God of Israel, the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps, chooses to forget. Forget about our past mistakes, our past stubbornness, our past hard-heartedness. God chooses to forget, our passage says. But can God forget? That is the question my mind forms in response. It feels a little like the unanswerable question posed to me in Sunday school class so many years ago as a, as a young man. The question was this, can God make a rock so big that God can't hold it over God's head? Try to answer that. So that is why I am holding up this strange phrase, forget about it. As it is nuanced and seems to stop short of vacating a memory. 
God promises to forget about it because God is promising a new covenant. One which surpasses or bypasses or replaces the old one. Which Israel couldn't or didn't keep. God is promising a new day is coming. When a new covenant will replace the old one. Now, our reading today is an Old Testament text referencing the coming of the Messiah, which will change everything. God is making a promise here in the pages of our Old Testament, testament just being an alternate English word for covenant. God is making a promise here in the pages of our Old Testament that a new covenant, a new testament is coming. But in order for that new covenant to take root, God is willing and seemingly able to forgive and, interestingly enough, to forget. The God of Israel, the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps, chooses to forget, chooses to remember Israel's sin no more. Can God really forget? Is this what is actually meant? Has God really forgotten their sins? Specifically, the whole golden calf incident, just forgotten? And the worship of foreign gods, entirely wiped clean? Can God really forget? And if God can forget, is God diminished? It is a startling, unexpected, if not uncomfortable way of talking about God. Because generally, when speaking of losing memory, it is not usually referenced as an admirable thing. And yet, if I'm totally honest, there are things in my life I wish I could forget. Indeed, a number of things, like, for instance, every slight and verbal injury received, which seem to stick in the recesses of the psyche, unsure at times if they were even intended as slights and yet unable to let them go. Or some of the painful things that I have laid onto others over the years, expressing inward anger or hurt feelings to some of the people I love. Would it not be wonderful for all parties to forget these relational damaging occurrences and in this way start afresh. But yet I get ahead of myself. So in our passage today, which is about a new covenant, a a covenant of God's doing intended to restore relationship, we see God choosing to forget, to forget all the ways Israel didn't hold up their end of the bargain of the old covenant. And I have to wonder, is this self-revelation from God, I have to wonder if this self-revelation from God is, is formative or instructive to us in some way. Is forgetting, for the sake of restoring relationship with another, something that we should try to emulate? Is that implied? After all, I imagine there are some things that only God can do. And if it is implied, is it something that God followers are to strive to do as well? Is it actual forgetting? Or does that God self-disclosure simply put an exclamation point? on the kind of radical forgiveness that God offers and that we receive and that we are possibly to emulate to others. Forgive and forget. You've heard the saying, but I wonder, is that, if that is something that we can do? In counseling, I don't recall that I have ever advised someone to forget unless it was in the New Jersey style of 
Forget about it. Which again is nuanced, but generally meaning simply to disregard something. I've not advised people to forget because the skeptical side of me is not at all sure that one can do this. And secondly, not at all sure that one should do this. You see, the things we have gone through, the wonderful things, the mundane things, the difficult things, the the horrible things, well, they all seem to add up to the people that we are now. And I suspect if we were able to somehow choose to forget that resulting amnesia would actually have unintended consequences on the individual that we have grown to be. Some of you know I am a science fiction fan, and I don't have to dig too deep in my science fiction collection to find the many warnings of the unwanted byproducts of a memory wipe. It has been a popular item in so many stories, from the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind to the series Heroes, which Laura and I are re-watching at this time, to Men in Black and their little cigar-shaped devices that keeps the citizenry on Earth in blissful ignorance of the existence of aliens. In each case, the procedure of wiping a memory also cuts out a part of who they are. Forgetting can change things in profound ways. And as I see it, memory is an important commodity, one we would typically cherish, for it is the conduit that connects us to the past, a past which is a very real part of who we are. Memory keeps us connected to the narrative of our life. Memory connects us to events gone by, both good and bad, And I have found that both the good and the bad of life have actually been quite formative and beneficial in my growth and in my ministry. For I draw on all those experiences of my past in order to do my job as your pastor. Further, there is the fact that so often in Scripture we are repeatedly challenged, well, to remember not to forget. Like James Earl Jones speaking from the sky, calling Simba to remember, remember. (laughs) Scripture often calls us to remember what God has done, to remember God's faithfulness and to be encouraged, to remember the exodus. Remember, remember. But in our passage today, God is talking about forgetting, that God will forget, literally that God will remember their sin no more. God will forget the very things that we would actually want God to forget. God will forget the offenses, the wrongheartedness, the obstinacy. God will forget how we couldn't pull our own weight under the old covenant. Here is that moment in our reading in verse 34. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Wow, and I find this quite amazing and empowering. What a gift it is for Israel and consequently for us that our misdeeds are not only forgiven but also forgotten. And I don't know this, but I suspect this. I suspect this forgotten spoken of in our passage is less about selective amnesia for God and more akin to a hearty New Jersey forget about it. That of, I will so disregard this memory that it will be like it never even happened. Oh, it happened. But God can move ahead like it never happened. That is what I mean by forget about it. 
And this, friends, I will also call grace. That God will not hold on to all of the selfishness, the stupidity, the wrong-hearted stuff that we have all done. And make no mistake, this, friends, is a gift. A gift that Israel needed back in the original telling in Jeremiah, but a gift that I need, a gift that each of us need. And while God is talking about God's self, that, that God will forget our offenses, it effectively means that God will totally disregard what might otherwise strain or destroy our relationship with the Almighty. Those were a lot of words, so I'm going to say it twice. It effectively means that God will totally disregard what might otherwise strain or destroy our relationship with the Almighty. Forget about it. God will disregard past failures for the promise of hand-in-hand present-day choices. God will disregard past failures for the promise of community within our future together. Once again, I call that grace. It seems the new covenant God is describing is, is chock full of grace. And getting back to my earlier pondering, while God is talking about God's self, revealing what God will do for us, I can't help but consider the fact that maybe if God acts this way for the benefit of you and me, that maybe, just maybe, there is something here for us to also enact which will benefit others in our lives. Is there in God's forget about it toward us something that we should enact toward others right here and now? So application number one I'm going to put on the screen in front of you says this. Should I try to forget about it, to set aside or disregard others' misdeeds against me to enable the possibility of a restored relationship with them? That is what God does here. Should we do it with others? It's a good and pertinent question, so I invite you to take a moment and to think back to a real-life relationship gone bad in your life. I'm guessing you don't have to think too hard to see that. Did it jump to mind? Think back to a moment where you were wronged. Would the outcome have changed if you had offered grace? Forgiveness, forget about it. If you, in response to some particular mistake, some hurtful word, some callous misdeed, if you moved forward as God does here for the expressed sake of relationship, with forget about it, with like it never even happened, could that have changed the landscape with that other person? So in a much broader sense, as we have pulled up those images in our own life and asked that question, in a much broader sense, we can appreciate the gift that God is giving to Israel, the gift that God is giving to us, this forget about it. Out of love for Israel, God has somehow chosen to forget about it, meaning to completely disregard those potential relationship-ending events as if they never happened. God says forget about it. This relationship is continuing. To enable God's new promised covenant, God's forget about, about its past offenses, to, in response to their failure, God refuses to recognize those past failures. In response to their infidelity, 
God calls them faithful. In response to their sin and brokenness and wretchedness, God chooses to not hold that past against them. God chooses to completely disregard those potential relationship-ending events because of love. Wow. And in application question one, might we do that for others in our life? I think yes. But let's go even further for this wow moment from God. This moment has influenced not only how we treat others, but also how we treat ourselves. And maybe we need to do that first. Have you ever been haunted by your past? So much so that it robs you of your present. Here's application question number two, right below question one. Should I try to forget about it, to set aside or disregard my misdeeds that I hold against myself to enable the possibility of a restored relationship with God and others? With God's help, might we also be able to forget those life-defeating junctures in our own life? Those moments and memories which sadly have held us back from using our God-given gifts, have held us back from risking ourselves to the benefit of others, has held us back from living life fully as God intends. Have you resigned yourself, your present, your future because of past events that made you feel unable or unworthy or unappreciated or unloved? Have you resigned yourself to living a discounted life? Well, that is not what God wants for you. So forget about it. Don't allow rewinds of the past to rob you of your present and your future. Maybe God wants you to forget about it within yourself. And God here is getting that ball rolling. Could there be application? Could God's commitment to forget about it with us inspire us to do the same first for ourselves as well as for others? I think God would have us here forget about it. For all those things in our past which hold us back, which limit our progress, and contribute to us not really grasping the grace and the abundant life that God truly wants for us. Is God showing us a way to heal broken relationships? By utilizing, forget about it, by disregarding, by seeing something bigger than all the crap of the past, which can cause a relationship to wither and die. God does it for us. And perhaps for it to truly take, we need to emulate that grace first for ourselves and then also for others. And I have an exercise to get us started. I want you to hold out both your hands and to cup them together in front of you. And I want you first to call to mind a, a difficult memory of something you wished that God would forget about. And imagine placing it in the bowl of your two hands. It could be an unkind word or deed, an action which harmed another, a bias which you lived into, anything in your past which haunts you and holds you back. Place it into your hand bowl right now. Now let's add to it. I want you to call to mind one or more things that you wished you 
could forget about within yourself. A slight given or received, a a hurt which pierced deeply, a betrayal, a disappointment, an anger that lurks within you and hinders you from becoming the person God created you to be. Whatever it is, it holds you back and perhaps has for quite some time. Now, I want you to put that also in your self-made bowl. So what you now have in your hand bowl is what you want God to forget about and what you want yourself to forget about. And right now, friends, is the perfect time for you to hear again God's word for this day. And it's in verse 34 of our passage where God says, For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And I want you to hear those words this way. I will forgive your iniquity and remember your sin no more. This is God's new covenant. And it has been enacted in Christ. And it is profoundly good news. Now I want you to take your hands, position them over the floor in front of you. Move your legs if you need to, because I'm going to have you open your hands and let those things fall to the ground. Turn over your hands and shake them a little bit. Make sure it's all out of there. I will forgive your iniquity, says God, and remember your sin no more. And friends, hear the good news. God already has forgiven and forgotten it. That is to say, God is more interested in your present and in your future than in your past. God essentially says forget about it because God is more interested in your present and in your future than in your past. God essentially says forget about it, both to offenses against God and offenses you hold against yourself. Forget about it. Friends, God doesn't want you holding on to that stuff because Jesus came for you to have life abundant, not for you to live in chains. And friends, even if it turns out that we cannot literally forget, maybe we can at least remember more fully that God's grace is sufficient. So that we can come to finally release that life limiting memory which has haunted us for far too long. I think the bigger picture in our passage today is that God is doing a new thing. Not only in Israel, not only in the coming age inaugurated by Jesus, but within you and me as well. So much so that the past however disappointing, is not something that should hold us back. Friends, look again at your hands. They are empty. They are cleared. So that you can actually use them in service to God instead of as a storehouse of regret. If God can forget about it, maybe you can too. So that the new covenant God has gone to great pains to make available to you and to me. So that the new covenant can actually be experienced and lived by you. And actually be shared by you to the benefit of others in the world here and now. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand with me and to sing together, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing.
Lessons from the Jersey Shore. Forget about it. God has. Will you? Amen. Thank you.